Good afternoon, everybody. Let's settle down. Wonderful. Um, so, a couple of things before I start. Uh, the material for last week and this week is taken from chapters 3 and 4 of the book. Uh, to, with tomorrow, we will be completing all the material that is there in chapters 3 and 4 of the first edition, Sam Harris, uh, Harris book. And the video is also recorded for this lecture. So, just in case, if, and it's already uploaded for last week. The slides, I have made some slight modifications. One that is online is a bit outdated, but it will, the updated one will be uploaded very, very soon. So, let's get moving. What did we do last week? We quickly saw some basic syntax of Verilog, how to instantiate modules. Modules are building blocks of Verilog. Then we discussed how one can realize or model in, in both behavioral as well as structural fashion any digital circuit. And then we went through a whole bunch of constructs, for example, and XR, how do, we, uh, how do we implement them in Verilog with the assign statement? And towards the end of the week, Frank actually started off the basic, uh, basics of sequential circuits. So now, today what we will be looking at is how do we actually realize these sequential circuits in Verilog? Last week, we looked at combinational circuits, and this week, it will be sequential circuits. And tomorrow, Frank will, again, come back to explain how to write test benches for your implementation, or rather, how to test your uh, code in Verilog, how to make hardware faster, what is, what, how to extract timing characteristics of a particular design. So these things will be done tomorrow. Uh, today, we will focus on how to implement the sequential circuits. So quick recap. Combinational circuits, we all know, takes a bunch of inputs, produces outputs based on some logic design. It has no memory. But when you want to introduce a sequential logic, you introduce a memory element. That is, you have to remember a certain state. So in some sense, one can say that a sequential circuit is a combination, or is a combination of the combinational circuit plus the memory element. And today, we will see how we will design in Verilog this entire different sequential circuits. Um, we will start with how to define blocks that have memories. You saw last week what are flip-flops, what are latches, finite state machines, favorite topics among students, and the exam questions. Um, and then we will see how to implement these, uh, these elements in Verilog. We will then see one of the fundamental characteristics of a sequential circuit is it's always triggered by a clock signal. And we will see how one can implement this in Verilog, or how, how one can realize these in Verilog. Remember the two differences, latches and flip-flops. Latches are sensitive to the level of the signal. What do I even mean by that? So, latches depend on whether the signal is having a zero or a one. But flip-flops are different. They, are, they get triggered on the edge. That is, during the transition from level zero to level one, the circuit gets executed. So this is, this is one of the fundamental differences between a latch and a flip-flop. And in order to realize all these logic, whatever we learned till now, such as assign uh, a, a bunch of combinational constructs, is not sufficient. We need something more. We need new constructs, and such as always and initial. We will look 
largely at how one can imp use always and implement all these uh, all these uh, logic circuits. I tried my best to come early and make use of this Wacom tablet so that I can actually draw here so that it gets recorded on the video. I failed miserably, so I'm going to switch back to blackboards, okay? Um, I tried my best because I found out that a lot of things were not recorded in the video, so I tried my best, but somehow it doesn't seem to like me. Uh, I'll switch back to Blackboard. Apologize for that. Um, so, what's an always statement? Uh, so, always statement looks like this. You have the keyword as such, always, and then you have an at symbol followed by what we call as the sensitivity list. So, how do you read this statement? You read as Execute whatever is there in statement always when any signal in the sensitivity list changes. So you always execute statement whenever any signal in the sensitivity list happens. So whenever the event is, that is mentioned here gets triggered. Very simple. Let's straight away dive into how do we implement flip-flops. So what's a, what's a flip-flop? You have a simple, so let's say a D flip-flop. You have input data, 4-bit data here, D. The output, Q, it's also 4-bit. And you have a clock signal. Typically, you use this um, notation to indicate that it's a clock with a trigger, so the, the V. So what happens in a flip-flop, as I mentioned in a couple, of slides, a couple of slides before, is that whenever the clock signal rises, you have to pass the input to the output, which basically means that Q gets assigned the value of D every time there is a rising edge of the clock. This is exactly how we implement here. So we say always, you use the always construct at pause edge of the clock. What does mean is that whenever there is an up-going transition or a positive transition, which is from level 0 to level 1, then execute the statement here. So the statement will only get triggered whenever there is a rising edge of the clock. And when it gets triggered, the value Q gets assigned the value D. Right now, Forget about this symbol. It's called the non-blocking assignment. Until 10 slides, just think that this is an equivalent to an equals. Okay, just think that it's this D gets assigned to Q. Don't worry about it right now. So another thing here is that whenever you use, so it's another rule when you use an always block is that all the signals that get assigned inside an always block. In simple terms, all these symbols, that is all the variables that you use on the left side within an always block has to be a reg. Okay? But note that whenever we say reg, it's purely a very log construct. It doesn't mean that the eventual circuit that gets realized is going to be a register. It could be a register, but it could be a simple uh, wire as well. So this is just a very log construct, and always make sure that any variable you use here within an always block on the left side has to be a register. That's it. This is one of the fundamental rules that, you, that if you apply, you will have less errors in your very log code. So this was a basic flip-flop with a clock. Triggered when there is a rising edge of the clock, you got the input data D and assigned it to Q. Now we will look at D flip flop with asynchronous reset. I hope you remember what an asynchronous reset is. Everybody remembers? Yes? No? I assume it's an yes. Can I? No. Good. Um, so an asynchronous reset is basically the master. What happens is that it, when it happens, 
it, no matter what the status of the clock is, the circuit will get reset. No matter what the set, uh, system status is, you send a reset signal, which is, can be a 1 or a 0, depending on how you are going to define it. It is going to reset your data. That's an asynchronous circuit. So how do you define that? So what you do is you include positive edge of the clock, but in addition to this, you will also say, I mean, this can also be pass edge of reset. Don't, uh, I mean, it's not a mandatory, it's not mandatory to actually have only neg edge of reset. What it just simply means is that whenever the reset signal goes from one to zero, also execute all the statements that are there inside this always block. So when there is a negative edge of reset, these statements get executed. When there is a positive edge of the clock, then these statements also get executed. Um, also, what you can do is, if there are multiple statements within an always block, you always append it with a begin and an end. You actually don't need it for this example because it's just if and an else. So it, it un Verilog understands that it's just one single construct. But we will see uh, a couple of examples where you have to introduce the begin and end. It's like the braces in C. So what happens here is that as soon as there is the negative edge of the reset, then or the positive edge of the clock, doesn't matter, uh, any of these events happen, the circuit checks whether the reset is equal to zero. And if it's equals zero, then your output value Q gets the value zero, that is reset, or else you simply follow the same procedure of D getting assigned to Q. So this is, this is a synchronous reset now. So we saw till now what's an asynchronous reset. Now it's a synchronous reset. Now what's the difference is that even if there is a change in the reset signal, the, system, the circuit will not reset until the clock is having the positive edge or there is a transient in the clock. Even if you, I mean, so, so in the previous circuit, whenever there was a change in the reset, irrespective of the state of the clock signal, the circuit got reset. But here, any changes in the reset signal will have to wait until the next rising edge of the clock. So it is synchronous to the clock signal. And as you can see, you don't include the neg edge of reset or in this example, so you always trigger the set of statements only on the positive edge of the clock. This is a very small change, but I would kind of tell you how this, I, I don't know how whether uh, Frank showed you how this all looks. So let me quickly show it. So let's say, let's say you have the clock signal. I hope it's visible to the last rows. Last rows, are you able to see what I'm writing? Okay, so you have a clock signal, and then you have the reset, and let's say you have Q, the output. So when I talk about an asynchronous reset, assume that whenever the reset goes high, I want to reset my circuit. I will, so let me just draw the transients. So whenever my reset goes high, irrespective of whether my clock is now right now in the transient, in the uh, rising edge or not, in an asynchronous reset system, my Q value, irrespective of what it was, will, will get reset to zero immediately in the same time frame. Okay? But when I'm talking about When I'm talking about a synchronous reset, the difference would be, sorry, oh man. So, um, so when you are talking about a synchronous reset, what happens is that even though the reset is high here, the system will actually wait 
the system will actually wait until the next rising edge of the clock to make Q0. So it's always, all the events will follow based on the rising edge of the clock. And that's the whole difference. A small change, and this can be implemented with just a small change in the always block by removing the neg edge of reset. And then you, you pretty much get, you, you get the whole circuit synchronous to the clock. There are reasons why you need both. So, any questions? Simple, difficult, all good? Okay. So, another realization is that you have another signal called the enable also. And what you can do here is that, so, let's, so what, what kind of a reset is this? What kind of a reset are we seeing here? Synchronous or asynchronous? Asynchronous. Perfect, asynchronous. It's because you have the sensitivity, in the sensitivity list, the, ne the reset, the negative edge of the reset, so whenever the negative edge is, so when, whenever you see a falling reset that's from one to zero, immediately the set of statements also gets executed irrespective of the status of the clock. So it's an asynchronous reset. And when you want to introduce enable, what you do is you can also use the if and else if, enable, then you pretty much assign Q to the values of D. It's pretty much like an if and an else statement in C or any other programming language. Very straightforward. And also you don't put enable into the sensitivity list. Because if you put enable into the sensitivity list, then the system is not going to, not only going to trigger when there is a rising edge of the clock or reset, but it's going to start triggering even for enable. Which basically means is that your circuit is no longer synchronous with the clock or it's no longer going to be um, sequential. So, Quickly, we, we, I mean, flip, so we saw till now flip-flops. And how do we implement a latch? What's the difference between a latch and a flip-flop? Latch is level triggered, right? Flip-flop is edge triggered. So what you make, what, what change you make here is you no longer use positive edge of the clock or negative edge of the clock. You simply use the signals itself in the sensitivity list. What this basically means is that whenever clock changes, it doesn't matter whether it's a rising edge from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, or whenever D changes, any bit of D changes, this statement will get executed. So whenever clock changes, whenever data changes, it will check if the clock is 1. Then Q gets assigned the value of D. That's it. So it's always level triggered. As simple as that. So, so, to summarize the sequential circuit so far, what we have seen is we introduced the notion of an always block. We kind of implemented how to trigger a bunch of statements with, on, a, on, a, you know, on a clock signal. And then what you should also remember is that whatever signal that gets assigned inside an always block. A simpler way to remember is whatever signals get are on the left-hand side of an always block assignments. You have to def uh, de define them or declare them as a register. Uh, this is something that you might want to keep, uh, keep note of for now. That is, this less than symbol followed by equal is a non-blocking assignment and the difference is that whenever you use the assign, which is purely combinational, you can simply use the equals. But when you are using any assignment within an always block, you use the non-blocking statement. Of course, you can also use blocking statement inside, but for now, let's say that inside, a non, inside an always block, you use non-blocking assignments to realize a sequential circuit. So you can, of course, have a whole bunch of always blocks inside module. So you can have multiple always blocks. For example, as you can see here, you have 
an always block which is triggered at the rising edge of the clock, and you have a value called special, which is the special gets assigned the value of D here, and here Q gets assigned the value of normal. So what happens here is that, as I said, anything on the left side of an always block is a register. So you see, you declare special as a register, and you can also include simple assignments in between always blocks. For example, just like in com it's a combinational logic, right? You assign normal equals the uh, inverted in invert of special. And normal, typically, you don't need to define it as register. So it's, it's, declared, it's, it's, it's declared as a wire here. Um, right. And also something that you might want to remember, it's not here on the slide, but you will end up using it in the lab, never assign the same value, for example, special, never assign it within the same module in two, al in two always blocks. You will have an error in your system because there is a conflict of what actually has to happen. So for example, never say special gets assigned the value of D in this always block, and then in this always block, don't say special gets assigned the value of normal. If you have two assignments in two different always blocks for the same variable, you're not, your, your circuit is going to be uh, throwing, up, throwing an error. Okay? So, why do you think an always statement memorized? So, the whole idea behind sequential logic is combinational circuits plus memory element. And where is the memory coming in, coming in from, right? So let's go back to the same flip-flop example. As you see, positive edge of a clock, you assign Q the value of D. But what happens when the clock is not rising? So what happens when there is no positive edge as I showed here? So what happens when it's a negative edge or it's a level, there is no event happening on the clock? The value of Q is basically preserved. So there's no change in the value of Q and it's actually memorized. So let's, go, let's take a different example now. So now what I have here is an, another always block, which is not edge triggered, but I put in my sensitivity list invert or in and data. So whenever there is a change in either the in signal or the data signal, the following statements gets executed. If in with one, you get a result of not of data, else result is assigned the value of data. So when here, when in this one, you know exactly what the result of result is going to be. And when in this zero, you also know what exactly the result is going to be. In other words, you have defined all the possible scenarios, or you have, you have given to the circuit what should happen in all the states of in and data. And if you do this, the circuit becomes combinational. So there is no need for a memory here. So in order to, so, so in some sense, what I'm trying to say here is that you can actually def, uh, declare a combinational or realize a combinational logic circuit with an always block as well. Just that you have to fully uh, define for all possible inputs what is your output. And then the circuit becomes fully combinational. It has no memory at all. Understood? So, to repeat, if within an always block, you define for a particular sig for, for, for the signals inside the sensitivity list, all possible combinations, so for all combinations of the signals in the sensitivity list, if you define what the output should be, the system is automatically becoming a combinational logic. You can use 
statements such as if, then, and else, which you will not be able to use if you are not using an always block. So you will have to live with the ternary operators that we saw last week. But here, within an always block, you can, always use, you can use if, then, else, and case statement. And also, you have, typically when you start programming in Verilog, you have a tendency to use always for everything. Don't do that. Use always only when it makes your job easier. So let's, let's go for, let's, let's see these two examples. It's a very simple example, actually. Both of them exactly implement the same feature, the same multiplexer. You use an always with A, B, so you have an always block with the sensitivity list of A, B, and select. And then you say if select is 1, you use the result as result gets assigned the value of A, else result gets assigned the value of B. It's a simple multiplexer. But we also saw in, uh, we saw last week that you can also implement a multiplexer like this, and it becomes a combinational logic. So this, it, it so you can implement in both ways, but typically this is a much better way for someone who reads it to understand that it's actually a purely combinational circuit. So don't simply go for an always block as always, but then there is, also, always constra uh, there, there are situations when always block is going to be very, very useful. Consider the seven-segment display. You will be programming them in your labs. You will be using them to display your adder outputs to play with your snake uh, implementations. Um, so you will have to, so depending on the data, so here we also introduce the case statement. So Case is dependent on the data signal, so if the data is zero, then you assign the value of segments directly a certain value, which will actually display, this value will actually display zero on the seven segment display. So this is basically the set of signals that you actually have to trigger to display zero, one, two, three, four, five on the seven segment display in your FPGA boards. So for this case, always block is of great help. So because you can directly use case without having to fiddle around with ternary operators and so on. Another thing that you have to remember when you are using a case and you want to case statement and you have to, and you want to realize a combinational logic. Remember, combinational logic. How do you how do you realize a combinational? Logic? You have to define or de uh, or um, define the result of all possible outputs of the signals in the sensitivity list. So you need to have the default here. If you don't have a default, the system can become a memory element. So you have to be careful here. Whenever you want to realize a combinational logic with a case statement, uh, you have to have the default statement. And when you say always, at another point, when you use star, it's a short form for all signals Whenever any change signal changes, you simply execute this uh, bunch of statements. Any questions? Simple till now? Yeah. If we have the register, right, um, they are kind of stored. Mm -hmm. Can we access them? If it's declared in the always block, say, here, mm -hmm. can we access this variable up here? Sure. Oh, okay. You can, but you have to be very careful there. Because if you are going to access the just access or read the values, it's okay. But if you are going to assign in multiple places, your circuit is circuit is going to be confused. The realizer is going to get confused. In, it's going to give you a conflict. So you have to be careful there. But you can do it. You can read out. Yeah. So what's a case statement? It's like if then else, but you can only use it within an always block, just like if then else. Um, combinational, if you define the output for all possible cases, therefore you use the default statement so that you don't forget any particular uh, case for which you don't have an output defined. You can also use case Z. I'm not going to go deep into it. You can check the, check the reference here. So it's not super important as well. So Coming to this important part where we kept skipping, I asked you to assume that this less than equal is more or less equals. So now is the part where we will differentiate between them. 
So on the left side is what we call the non-blocking statements, which you have the less than and an equal. On the right side are what we call as the blocking statements, which is the standard equals. The difference is that in such an assignment within an always block, all these values, so all the assignments, are going to be made such that A is going to take the value of 1 and B is going to take the value of A at the same time at the end of the block. So it's blocking. I mean, sorry, it's non-blocking, which basically means that all these values are going to get parallelly executed. Whereas here, every statement is a blocking statement. What that means is that unless the statement is executed, the next statement is blocked. It's very similar to, a, to the conventional programming language. So you have A taking the value of 1 right here, and then B takes the value of A, the correct value of A. So you have B turning to 1 at the end of the block straight away. Uh, why, so, so the question is, why do we even need these statements, right? You will, as and when you start implementing, you will realize the importance of it, and it's a bit more technical, so we will, if you're interested, I will point you to some good literature for that, but let's now skip this. But, uh, so, what is important to remember here is that when you say block, when you use blocking statements inside an always block with the conventional equals, it's more or less like a programming language. All the statements are going to get executed sequentially. So I would come to this last statement with an example, which is it's much more easier to understand what I mean by that. So consider this simple example, always at star, which is like whenever so all signals are in the sensitivity list, whenever any signal changes, execute, this, execute the block. You assume that all the inputs are zero, initially at zero, which basically means that P, G, S, and C out are all going to be zero at this point in time. Now, let's say A changes to 1, P becomes 1, G is 0, S is 1 right here, because these are all blocking statements. So you have the value of P already here by the time this statement is executed, so S is going to be 1 here, and C out is 0. So at the end, S takes the value of 1. Now, assume that all the blocks that you are having inside, the, all the statements that you're having inside an always block is non-blocking. What happens here, again, all the inputs are zero, and when A changes to one, P becomes one, but S is still zero. Because all the values gets assigned at the same time, only at the end of this block. So S is still zero. However, since P has changed, this block is going to get executed again, and then S is going to take the value of 1. The only difference is that, so that, that's exactly what I meant by this statement, where if you are giving the sensitivity, correct sensitivity list, the behavior of both blocks with non-blocking statements and blocking statements will eventually evaluate to the correct result, just that it's going to get executed a couple of iterations more. That's it. Any doubts? No. Good. So, some rules for signal assignment. If you, have, if you want to realize synchronous sequential logic, always use non-blocking inside an always block. And when you want to realize combinational logic with the assigned statement, you always use blocking statements. So it says you can use a simple equals. If you use this statement, the non-blocking statement here, you are going to end up with an error. And if you use an equals here, you make sure that you know what you're doing. Okay? And you really want the combinational logic or the kind of behavior that you're expecting to put. The so simple, uh, the simple uh, assumption can be just say, I will use, for realizing a sequential synchronous circuit, I will use only non-blocking statements within an always block. Easy, straightforward, extremely simple. So 
So this is what I meant here. If you are going to use an equal inside and always block, know what you're doing. It's more, you can realize combina complicated combinational logic. And as I mentioned before, do not make assignments to the same signal to more than one always block. If you have multiple always block, don't make the assignments to the same signal in more than one block. We can start finite state machines right away, or we can take an early break. Which one do you want? And we reconvene at 2.5. Okay. Yeah? And I, I'm sure you will be leaving in two five, around 2.45, so... Take a break? Okay, let's take a break now. <laughs> so, let's get started. There was a couple of questions uh, regarding why would anyone use a non-blocking statement in such a scenario. So what I would like to stress here is that you should not use non-blocking statements here. It's just an example where I tell what will be the effect if you use a non-blocking statement. So don't think that why would anyone use it? Isn't it wrong? Why are we even showing this? It's just an indication to, it's just for you to know that whenever there is a dependency, for example, you have, you write to the value P, and then you read from the same value P and assign it to a different value within the same always block, always use blocking statement, unless you, again, know what you want to achieve. So this is not something that you have to use, or it's an option, but it's, it's a bad practice when you are going to use dependent statements in the same always block with a non-blocking statement. Okay? Let's move on. So, finite state machines. Um, you will have one question in the exam based on finite state machines, pretty much... 14 to 15 points, so kind of important out of 75. So if you remember, FSM has three different, three different parts, what's called as the next state logic. You have a state register, and then you have an output logic. Do you remember last week? Good. I didn't want to take a chance, uh, nevertheless. So you have two different FSMs, Mooley, sorry, Moore and Mealy. Um, what is this? What is this? Is it a Mealy or a Moore? Why? It's a Moore. Why? Exactly. So in a Moore. FSM, you don't have, so the outputs depend only on the state and not on the inputs. So a quick recap, pretty much the same slides what uh, Frank did last week. You have, so, what's, so you have these three different parts. You have a state register, which basically memorizes what is the current state of the circuit. Since it has memory, it's a sequential circuit. Then you have the next state logic, which means that it's a combinational circuit which determines, based on some inputs, what is going to be the next state. And then you have the output logic itself, which is also combinational. Now what we will see is how do we realize this in Verilog in a very clean manner. Let's start straight away with an example, a divide by three. What so we are trying to, what we are trying to realize here is a circuit where the, out, the, y, the signal Y is going to go high for every third clock, clock, clock edge. So you have here, it, it goes high for one clock cycle, 
And then after that, it counts one, two, three. And every third clock cycle, the output of Y goes high. So in some sense, you can also call it a frequency divider circuit, which you will also implement as a kind of a small project, a small uh, module in your uh, labs. So if you want to realize this circuit as a finite state machine, this is how it, it's pretty much one way of do, doing it. You have, whenever you reset, let's say whenever the signal is, the circuit is reset, my output is going to be one because it's, I will assume that it's the beginning of the, beginning of the sequence. And then from S0, you always move to S1 on every rising edge of the clock. And what is inside these state machines is the output, so y is still zero. And then from in the next rising edge of the clock, you move to the next state. Again, output is zero. And then in the third rising edge of the clock, you go to S0, where your output is one. This is pretty much a very simple finite state machine that we are going to try and realize in Verilog. So we start, basically, with defining these registers called the state and next state. How many states are here? Three. So we need at least two bits to store the values of state, the, the, the state, state values itself, both the state and the next state. So you define register, a two-bit register, state for state and next state. Parameters, you can also kind of, to improve your readability, you can assign values for each of these states uh, as a constant using the parameter. So after this, we start with the first part of the FSM. It's the state register. So what happens when a, in a state, we, we've seen that a state register is a sequential circuit. And in order to realize a sequential circuit, you use the always block, we just saw before the break. So pretty much the system, the circuit will look like this. You have the next, so at the rising edge of the clock, you have the current state being assigned the value, the next state. So it's kind of a flip-flop, right? So you implement exactly the same, exactly that. So you say always at the rising edge of the clock and rising edge of the reset. So what is this? Asynchronous reset or asynchronous reset? Asynchronous reset or synchronous reset? It's an asynchronous reset. Because your block is getting executed even for any change in the reset signal. Then if there is a reset signal is high, you assign the value state to S0. And else, for every rising edge of the clock, you simply switch to the next state. This is this three statements these three lines, rather, is going to be the same for any FSM that you're going to implement. So when you're going to do an FSM for your lab project, which is most likely four or five, you will have to implement an FSM. And this is pretty much a copy paste of the state register. It's not going to change much. So the next one is the next state logic, which is as if you remember, it's a combinational logic, right? So for that, what we will use is a simple case statement, which we have already seen. So we will assign based on the current state. So it's a very simple state machine. So you have, based on the current state, the next state is very straightforward. There's no necessity, necessity to check for any input signals, nothing. So whenever you have S0, the next state is S1. Exactly that. You just check, sorry, you just check for the value of state. If it's S0, the next state is S1. Similarly, S1, S2, S2, back to S0, and you include the default to make it a fully combinational circuit. Any doubts till now? No. Good. And then comes the final part of the FSM output logic. And again, this is extremely simple here for this particular FSM. You're going to assign the value of the output value 1 whenever you are in the state S0. That's it. So you have 
q equal assign the simple output logic assign q equals if state is in s0 that's it and since the output is only dependent on the state it's a more type fsm and quickly i will go through the this is the entire code for this whole logic you have the state register which is a memory it's it's sequential logic so you also use Remember, you, you use um, non-blocking statements here because you want to realize a sequential logic with memory here. And then you use the next state logic, which is combinational, which means that we are going to define the output for all possible values of state. So you use always at star and state and the default value along with um, blocking statements. And then you have... A, output logic here which is basically a simple combinational logic right any questions good then we go to the smiling so this is slightly more complicated example the famous smiling snail example where i i i think this was also explained in doing the sequential uh, circuits class so what happens here is that whenever the snail is crawling down a bunch of paper tapes with ones and zeros and whenever it comes across the values 1 1 0 1 it has to smile okay so you cannot make the snail smile but you can at least go, uh, go out and binary output 0 or 1 where 1 means somehow it you can think that it's a smile, and zero is it's sad. Okay? And we can realize the exact same circuitry for the same logic in two different FSMs. Which one, quickly, which one is a Moore and which one is a Mealy? So both of these state machines are designed for this particular circuitry. Which one is Moore? Which one is Mealy? <laughs> Perfect. There's actually an easier way, which I actually learned a couple of weeks ago, which I didn't know after so many years. Moore, for given a particular problem, Moore state machine always has more states. <laughs> okay? Moore. Moore state machine always has more states. This, is, well, this was news to me, and I quickly looked it up, and it's typically the case, okay? So it's super easy. You don't have to worry about inputs, outputs, nothing. You just say, if they, say, if they give you two different state machines for a simple problem, you can kind of blindly guess, take a 98% guess that if you have more states, that's more. Interesting. Okay, so... What we saw in the previous example was the implementation of a Moore finite state machine. But now what I would like to show you is how we would implement a Mealy state machine. So let's, let's go through the same procedure. We start with a smiling snail module. We have input A, output Y. Um, if you remember in a Mealy case, all your inputs and outputs are shown on the transition arc. So the first value is the input, and the second value is the output. So here one, it's a bad circling point. So here one is A, and Y is uh, 0. So as before, we have four different states. So we start with a two, we need two bit registers for state and next state, and we will make constant para, we can param, we will make constant parameters for s zero to s three um, yeah okay as I said, the state register logic remains exactly the same there 's no difference from the previous code. you have positive edge of the clock. Positive edge of the reset. If, if, if the reset is high, 
state always goes to S0, state always goes to S0, and then if it's not so, then at every rising edge of the clock, your state is next state. This is pretty much going to be the same for all the state machines that you're going to write. But the next state logic is slightly more complicated here. That's all. Because the next state logic is not just a simple, assign, a simple equals, because now you have to figure out, based on the input, whether you want to move to S1 or S0. So let's, let's, let's actually see how the state machine works, okay? So you, when, I, when I reset, we start with S0. And based on my, so when the snail is going over a 1, it may be, because we are going to look for a 1, 1, 0, 1. Uh, if it sees a 1, it jumps to the next state. Now if it sees a 0, then your sequence is broken, so you go back to S0. But if you see a 1, if the snail sees a 1, then you say, ah, okay, 1, 1, so you go back, go to S2. Now if you see a 1, it, can, it is broke, breaking the current sequence, but however, it may be a start of another sequence, so you go, but you stay in the same value. I will, you, will, you will understand this better when I finish. So you will, now when I see a 0, you're, you jump because you're seeing 1, 1, and the next value the snail is seeing is a 0, so it's closer to smiling. Um, and all these, during all these transitions, you have the output always 0, so the snail is still sad. And then, as soon as it sees a 1, the sequence is complete, your output is 1, and it goes back to S1. Why do you think it's going back to S1 and not S0? Yeah? Yes, and? <laughs> I, maybe you, you know what it is, but maybe, yeah. Exactly. So, and, oh, yeah. so it's, a kind, it's in the middle of an overlapping sequence. For example, when I have the sequence of 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. I hope, let me just quickly, just to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about. So if I have a sequence like this, my snail has to smile twice. It's because you find an overlapping sequence, so it has to smile here, and it also has to smile here. Everywhere else, it's going to be very sad. Okay? So if I actually go back to S0, then you're not going to detect this overlapping sequence. That's why you go back to S1, because you maybe there is a start of another sequence. And when you want to realize this, and this is pretty much the reason why you have, why the circuit stays in the same state S2 here. So when you want to realize the state machine using the case statement, you can include if and else within a case statement. So let's take an example S1. If my input is 1, my next state has to be S2. If it is not, then my next state is going back to S0. My next state is 0. That's it. So you implement exactly this with case and if else, and don't forget to give the default, which is always next state is S0. So with this, you end up implementing the next state logic completely. Any questions still now? No. Yep. What happens if we don't Then you might potentially end up with memory, with a latch. So you will not, uh, you will, so what's going to happen here is you don't know if, if there is, so here it might not be a problem because you have defined each and every state. So in this case, it might not be a problem. But if you have, uh, let's say 8, so if you have a 3-bit state register, but you care about only 5 states, 
and then you have you do, you, the output is not defined for three of them. What that basically means that the system doesn't know what to do, so it will memorize and it will stay in whatever state it was. You might potentially end up realizing a sequential circuit and you will have a different behavior. But in this case, the default is not necessary because you have completely defined for all the states what is the output. But you will end up with sometimes you only use six out of the eight possible values and you don't have the, the two are remaining and you don't want a memory for that. Yeah. Why do you, this you don't need to, but it makes life easier. This is pretty much what uh, we saw where. So we saw it here, right? Mm, yeah. So both this and this realize exactly the combinational logic. Both of them realize a multiplexer. This takes more effort. This is much easier to read. We know that it's a combinational logic. But sometimes, always statements are great. Exactly this kind of a scenario where you have, otherwise you will end up writing ternary operators and make your code not readable. So it's much more easier to write it in an always block. That's it, nothing more. Good. So the final part of the FSM, which is the output logic. And here, remember that we are implementing a melee, which means your output is dependent not only on the state, the current state, but also what's the input. So you have, based on if you are an S3, so if your state is S3 and your input is 1, then the output is 1. It's exactly what happens here. So you have, if your state is S3 and your input A is 1, then your output becomes 1. And it's a very, it's a simple combinational uh, circuit. Any questions? And this is the entire code that we saw broken down, starting with two-bit registers, parameters, you have the standard state register statement. Literally, you can copy paste it uh, to any different any FSM that you're implementing. Uh, the next state logic, which we saw, with some checks for the input values, and then the output, which depends on the current state as well as the input. Any question? Yeah. This is the if condition. It, you, it gets overwritten here, you mean? No, in the, in the always block, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, it happens at every clock cycle. Yes. So the state gets overwritten at every clock cycle. Yeah, but then would we already be in state 1 while they would be 1 in the always block? So something to remember here is that the always blocks, so all these statements gets executed parallelly. It's not sequential. If you are using blocking statements within an always block, then you are going to implement, you are going to realize it sequentially. Otherwise, what happens here is at the same time when these circuits are getting executed, this is also going to get executed. So the assigned statement is a simple combination logic which is going to get executed every time there is a change in A and state. So it's always going to be ready to go. And all these statements that you see, even though they are in different always block, both these always blocks are going to get triggered parallelly if necessary. So for example, if the clock changes, this will also get triggered. If the reset get changes, this will also get triggered because you have used the word, you use star. But just that it has nothing to do, so it will just be the same, same it will execute, it will end up with the same results. And however, there will be cases where if there is a change in, say, next state, for example, this block is not going to get executed because it's going to wait only for the changes in clock and reset. So when, but whenever there is a change in clock, even this block is going to get executed. But when there is a change in the next state, 
this block is not going to get executed. So it's really a matter of the sensitivity list here. And don't, I, I mean, it's very important to get into this mindset, especially when you're writing hardware description languages, no matter if it is VHDL or Verilog, that whatever you write here are all going to get executed at the same time. And the only difference is going to be whether it's a blocking statement, non-blocking statement, and the sensitivity list, of course. That's it. Yeah, yeah, because you, yeah, here this is combinational, exactly. So blocking statement blocks only inside the always block. Good point. Great. Actually, we are coming to the end of the show. Great. Uh, so what did we learn? We defined sequential circuits in Verilog. We introduced always statements. Uh, how an always statement can be used to memorize elements. We saw what's the difference between the blocking and un non blocking statement. And then we saw how to define the various parts of a finite state machine from next state, out next state logic, the output logic, and the state register. We saw how to do delatch. The difference between flip-flop and latch, how you can realize a flip-flop, how you can realize a latch in Verilog. You learned something new that Moore has more states. Um, the melee output, tip, so you, you remember that there are two, Moore and melee state machines. We saw how to implement both Moore state machine and melee state machine in Verilog. Um, and what you will see tomorrow is timing. How do you extract timing for all these circuitry? How do you define how fast a particular circuit has to be executed? What, what defines these delays? Why are 2.4 gigahertz Pentium processors more difficult to achieve? Or how, why, why is it that 2.4 gigahertz is, is 2.4 gigahertz clock rate? And why? We started off with 8 megahertz, and so you will see all these timing characteristics of how to make your circuit run faster. Uh, and also, you will see how to verify your very log circuit right using test benches and simulations tomorrow, which is very important for your labs as well. With that, I would like to say that I totally enjoyed teaching you folks. It's goodbye from me, hopefully, for this semester. See you. <laughs>